Matthew chapter 5, verse 43 through 48. We're finishing up the first chapter of Jesus' most famous sermon, the Sermon on the Mount. And uh, it's probably good for us to always remember as we're going through the Sermon on the Mount that the, the book of Matthew ends with go therefore into all the nations, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And that's happening this morning. That's what we're doing. We're learning to obey everything he's commanded you. And sometimes we say things like, oh, you know, Christian, non-Christians can't be expected to obey Jesus. And that's true in one sense. It's true that non-Christians don't have a heart and uh, that would be led to obey Jesus. But it's kind of off, too, because if you're here as a non-Christian, it really is my goal to teach you to obey the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and our non-Christian friends and family, part of our goal in their lives is to teach them to obey uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. Of course, that includes teaching them the great salvation that comes first uh, before you obey, the, the way he obeyed where we didn't obey, and so that we could be forgiven and then begin to obey. But we're really in this process, aren't we, that Jesus commanded of learning to obey everything that he has commanded and he's with us through that whole process of learning to obey him. And so I want to focus on one of his most distinct commands. Uh, one of the most distinct commands that's ever been given by any religious leader of all time. And that's the command to love your enemies. To love your enemies. Matthew chapter 5, verse 43 you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes his son rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even Gentiles do the same? You therefore must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Father, would you come now and take what I have prepared but then do something spontaneous in this moment, Lord. Do the active work of the Holy Spirit in each individual hearts, giving me faithfulness to expose your scripture, to prophesy, and to speak your word so that your people are built up by a power greater than our own. Lord, we pray and ask you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. I thought about uh, how to introduce this sermon and I thought maybe the way to introduce it in a way that would make it the most profitable to you would be to begin by asking each and every one of you to do a little enemy inventory before we begin. Who are your enemies? Who has been an enemy to you? Now, sadly, for some of you, there's an immediate name, uh, there's an immediate face. And then maybe for others it would take a little bit of uh, mental jogging before we thought about this, but I think it's important to do it because we're not simply learning to obey in the abstract. We're really learning to obey in the very concrete areas of our life where we get to put Jesus on display. You are the only person on the planet located where you are with the particular circumstances and people and surroundings that you have. And you are the only person uh, really who is able in a distinct way that you're positioned to love the enemies you have. So who are they? And when I think about uh, this room, even just a little bit, I can think about even brothers and sisters in this room who were forced to leave Afghanistan because of having enemies that would threaten their very lives. Uh, there's others here who have lived on family land 
And then their Christian convictions became so at odds with what was going on in the family that they either had to leave the land or learn how to navigate that. I think about some who've served as missionaries and, and the, the outpost they had where they served is now threatened by those who were enemies of the gospel around their surroundings. It, it might also help us to think that, to remember what we learned when we thought about persecution a number of weeks ago, that persecution really has a gamut, doesn't it? Persecution include you being, can include you being hunted, imprisoned, maimed, killed, but the Gospel of Luke describes persecution as just being hated. It might help us to really make this practical if we included Christians in our enemy list. And I say that for a couple of reasons, and I want to be careful, and some caveats are definitely necessary to think that way. But I think we ought to for a few reasons. One, there are simply just nominal Christians in the world. There are Christians uh, in, in the world who really know nothing of Christ. They're, they follow the ways of the devil. And so just because someone sort of tags on the label Christian, we might forget to apply this love your enemy to them. Paul certainly had enemies who at least at one time would have called themselves Christians. You think of Demas and Alexander the coppersmith. He actually tells Timothy to watch out for Alexander the coppersmith. The guys who were destroying the gospel in the book of Galatians, they weren't running around saying we're not Christians. They, they named the name of Christ, and yet they were opposed to the gospel. Even Christians who are on the way up can sometimes play the, the role of enemy, can't they? Um, you think of the apostle Peter. Right after this amazing insight, Jesus says, who do you say that I am? Peter says, you're the son of God. He nailed it. And Jesus says, well, flesh and blood hasn't revealed to you this to you, but my father is in heaven. And then Jesus tells Peter he's gonna go to the cross. And Peter's like, that's a bad idea. And, and Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. And what's Satan translate to? It just means get behind me, adversary. And there are times when Christians, because Christians can be immature, uh, Christians can be carnal, not as a permanent state, but as a reality. There can be Christians who walk in the flesh at times, and they can set themselves up as opposed to other Christians. Some of you have maybe had uh, finances compromised by those who would name the name of Christ. Some of you have had your good name slandered because of those who would name the name of Christ. And maybe after all of this, you're going, nope, none, none yet, no enemies, sorry. Well, I'll give you two categories. One for parents, your, your children can act very adversarial to the cause of Christ. I know that's like heresy in a sentimental generation. Kids are just always such a blessing, except when they're not. Um, and, and, and if you read the book of Proverbs, you'll find that all these things we call a blessing, right? Wealth, wives, children. Well, actually, if you read the book of Proverbs carefully, it, it says wealth can be a blessing, wealth can be a curse. Wives can be a blessing, wives can be a curse. Uh, children can be a blessing, children can be a curse. It really depends on the wife, the child, and how the money came to you and what's the state of your heart once you get it. And the fact is that Jesus told us that some of the enemies in our lives would be children or adults sometimes of our own household who oppose what we're trying to cultivate in our homes with the gospel. Well, one last group of enemies maybe to think about. I don't think it's very hard for Christians to, to maybe think about the ways in which our culture is becoming more and more antagonistic to the gospel. It's been often pointed out that one of the most insightful commentaries on the Sermon on the Mount is written by Dietrich Bonhoeffer, The Cost of Discipleship, and it's written right before, Bonhoeffer's a German pastor, and it's written right before Bonhoeffer would lose his life to Hitler's regime, to the Third Reich. And it's not an accident that one of the greatest commentaries on loving your enemies and facing persecutions come to us from a man who's sort of in a culture where the, the water is boiling. 
And he's given grace by God to equip his fellow believers for what's coming. And so we really ought to be taking this teaching very seriously, whether there's a concrete face in your mind or there's a general sense that there's more and more advers adversarial attitudes and actions coming towards me, or if you're thinking about going to the foreign mission field or sending to the foreign mission field, you're really thinking about engaging with enemies. Those who will be against you. So what does this passage teach? Well, the first thing it teaches is that we are called to display the Lord Jesus Christ. When it comes to enemies, we're called to display the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at the command. It says this. It says, I say to you, love your enemies. I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Now, one of the things we can often do is we can separate Christ from his commands. And the foolish thing about separating Christ from his commands is we forget that if Christ is perfection itself, which he is, then all of his commands are merely going to be calls to reflect him, to put him on display. And it's not an accident that the person who at the end of the book dies for his enemies, here at the beginning of the book, calls us to love our enemies. He's only calling us to be like him, to be just like he is. He's the one. Now think about this. Think about what this would take. After Judas has betrayed him and the Jews have arrested him, and the soldiers have beaten him, and the Romans have crucified him. He's on the cross, and from the depth of his heart, what comes out is, Father, forgive them. It's a, it's, it's a desire of love. And not just to his enemies 20 years later, oh, I let a little time get under my belt. Yeah, they crucified me way back then, but a hot time heals all wounds. No, it's, it's in the moment. It's, it's while he is splayed out, naked, shamed, pained. It's right then and there that he's praying for the Father to forgive. And you might say, well, that was just a general prayer, kind of hoping they would be forgiven. Not all of them repented. Not all of them were forgiven. Okay, fair enough. But all that are now his friends were his enemies. What does the book of Romans say? Romans chapter 5. One will hardly die for a righteous man. Maybe there's some great political leader, fine moral caliber. There used to be such things. They exist. But anyway, there, there's, one will hardly die for a righteous man. Perhaps for a good man, someone might die, dare even to die. But God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He, he died for you and I when we were his enemies. To be a sinner is not just a, a mental health condition. To be a sinner is to be a rebel against God. To be a sinner is to want God off the throne. To be a sinner is to be someone who instead of wanting God to be exalted in every circumstance, wants me to be exalted in every circumstance. And right when we were there, wanting me to be the center of every situation, and me to be glorified in every circumstance, and me to follow my own way all the time and do what I think is wise, when that was me, that's when he dies for us. Not for anybody who's cleaned up their act, not for anyone who's improving, not for anyone who's trying, but for people who are going the other way. That's who Jesus dies for. He dies for his enemies. He dies for sinners. And so when he says, love your enemies, you are not being commanded to do anything except just be like him, which is what all his commands 
call us to. And, and really, when you look at it like that, it ties us into something bigger, doesn't it? Because the reason you were made was to put him on display. Right? How shall I make man? Genesis chapter 1. In the image and likeness of God. The very fabric of your being was created so that you would be a perfect medium for God to express his message. So that you could be a perfect canvas for him to put his love on display. You get up to the New Testament, starts working out what it looks like to be saved. What does it tell us? It tells us we were made new so we could be made new in all righteousness and holiness. The whole reason you and I exist is to put God on display. And the pinnacle of putting God on display is when you and I are most like Jesus Christ, even to the point of loving our enemies. You know, there's a story I've told for years, and I've never used the names when I tell this story, but I think it makes sense to, to use the names because it, it adds some sobriety to it these days. But years ago, I listened to an interview between Mark Dever, a pastor in Washington, D.C., and Josh Harris, a pastor at that time in Gaithersburg, Maryland. And Dever asked Harris, you know, hey, Dever was an older guy at that time, and not that much older, probably my age, actually. But he was, uh, anyway, so he's an older guy at that time. And uh, he asked Joshua Harris, who was about 30 at that time, What's the difference between being a Christian when you're 18 and when you're 30? What's the difference? And Harris, I thought, I think I've got a grave answer. I've always loved this answer. He said, at 18, you're making those big decisions, those big directional decisions. Am, am, I, am I a Calvinist or am I an Arminian? Am I a complementarian or am I a egalitarian? Am I a Baptist or a Presbyterian? Like you're, and, then, and then am I going to be an engineer or am I going to be a doctor? Am I going to go to this church or am I going to go to that church? Am I, am I going to serve the Lord in this country or another country? Just the big ones. Am I going to marry her or him? And what, what, The big stuff is coming at you in those early days. And I'll get to the rest of the story, but let me just say to you, if you're 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, still undecided at 25, 26, 27, <laughs> there's a lot of decisions to make. You're going to get a trade, you're going to get a degree, and you know what? Those are the important decisions, important to pair your opportunities and your gifts. It's all important. But as anyone who's lived a long time knows, you might get this degree and then when I'm doing that job, or this might shock you, your life might not turn it as you plan. For those of you who are not planning, you're like, well, that's good news. But, <laughs> but here, here, let me say something to you. Whether you're gonna be a doctor, an engineer, HVAC technician, Whatever it is, the central decision you want to make is I want my life to display the glory of God. That's the big one. And you can do that with a white collar on. You can do that with a blue collar on. You can do that as an employer, as an employee. Jonathan Edwards, the greatest theologian this country has ever produced, wrote a series of resolutions when he's 19 years old. Here's number four. Resolve never to do any manner of thing, whether in soul or body, less or more, but what tends to the glory of God, nor be, nor suffer it if I can avoid it. And I would just say to you, if you're making decisions at early life, that's the most important one. Whether the earning potential is 35K or 85K is important, wise, think about it. But the big one is, Lord, unite my heart to fear your name. 
Lord, let me use my whole life to put you on display. That's what Jesus' commands are doing here. That's the whole point of him telling us that's the reason for the command. Love your enemies. Why? I love my enemies. What are you made for? You're made to put me on display. And that's the more important issue. Parents, that's the one to think through with your kids above every other one. Back to the story. So Dever asks Joshua Harris, what's the difference between being 18 and being 30? 18, making big decisions, and then Harris, I think, so wisely. And if you don't know, I hate to say it, but you may be aware now that Joshua Harris has renounced the Christian gospel, left his pastoral calling, left the faith. But a number of years ago, he wisely says, 18, you're making the big decisions, and at 30, you're just trying to put one foot in front of the other to live out the big decisions you already made. That's good. And let me tell you a story about my own heart, my own life, as it relates to this text. So the way I was gonna introduce this sermon originally was by beginning to talk to you about expressive individualism. What's expressive individualism? Expressive individualism is just a two word, a description of the basic philosophy that's abounds today. It's the philosophy, you, you may not be a philosopher, but you know this. It's the philosophy that says you do you, follow your feelings. The ultimate authority is what you feel. Who you are on the inside is the real you. Don't let any religion, any traditions, anything get in the way of you being you. Don't let your biology get in the way. Don't let your church get in the way. Don't let your government get in the way. Whatever's in here, that's what you do. And you know, I was thinking about the culture out there. And uh, anyway, that was on my mind. That was the plan. Thinking about the problem of expressive individualism out there in the world. Then I found out Tim Keller died. And uh, many of you uh, have listened to Tim Keller. If you don't know Tim Keller, one of the most famous preachers in this generation, a man who's helped many understand the gospel, a man who's done the unthinkable in some ways, plant a mega church in Manhattan. And uh, I, my life's been deeply influenced by Tim Keller. I was mentored at a church that was basically carbon copied off of Tim Keller's blueprint of Presbyterian Church in downtown Toronto, the Manhattan area of Canada. And that's where I cut my teeth in ministry and I worked for a brother who had similar giftings to Tim Keller in terms of being able to weave the culture and the text together. So I was thinking a lot about Tim Keller's death and uh, thinking about just a good man dying, thinking about places I didn't agree with Tim Keller, uh, thinking about mortality. And then I just found that I was kind of just, it was sort of like unsettled, just this unsettled feeling. I was trying to watch a movie with my kids and it's just like angst, kind of anger. I'm like, what is that? And, and so then I, I go out and I start praying. I said, we're gonna watch something else. And I said, give me a half an hour, I need to go pray. And I went to go pray. And I started thinking to myself, I think I'm jealous. I think I'm jealous of Tim Keller. I'm a little jealous that he got to be a voice of a generation, that he's got all kinds of people writing things about him when he dies. And I'm not sure I'm a big fan of this just putting one foot in front of myself in obscurity until I die. And I know that's a preacher version of that, but uh, I'm aware that discontent may affect a few of you. And without just ripping on one man, Josh Harris was not able to put one foot in front of him, the other till the very end. And so I just want to say to you, this command of Christ to glorify him, to do what he says, to put him on display, to love your enemies, you don't need a big platform to do it. You can do it in whatever obscurity God's called you to. 
And in fact, your obscurity is part of the plan for God to be glorified everywhere in the world. Because not everybody can reach everywhere. There has to be people in every nook and cranny displaying Jesus because Jesus wants his glory to cover the earth as the water covers the seas. And so where you are is no distraction from what God's doing in the world. There's no such thing as being sidelined on God's planet. Where you are is a place where you can love the unlovely. It's where you can love the unlovable. And no one may write the obituary. They may forget about you. You might wind up in a pauper's grave. You may not be an influencer to anyone. But you can do the thing, the highest calling a soul could ever have. To put Jesus on display in his love for sinners. What could you go after that would be better? What could you hope for than to be placed on this planet, you, an enemy of God, who Jesus loved when you were his enemy, and now you get to display him by loving your enemies? There's nowhere to rise. There's nowhere to go. There's no up from here. And from there, all kinds of contentment in the commandments of God can flow. So first thing, as we think about our enemies, is that wherever you are, whoever those enemies are, you're called to love them, and that's your center stage. To put the glory of God in Christ on display. Now, the second thing I want you to notice is that it all starts with prayer. It all starts with prayer. Do you see that? Love your enemies, verse 44, and pray for those who persecute you. I I have marveled this week and last at the wisdom of making the one concrete application prayer. And I I think it's, it's incredible for a number of reasons that the one practical way we're told to love our enemies is prayer. I think it's, it's incredible for a couple of reasons. One, because it's the only command you could say about loving enemies that you can always apply. Now here's what I mean. Sometimes you're supposed to feed your enemies and eat with them. Romans chapter 12. It says, feed your enemy when they're hungry. Sometimes You're supposed to give your enemies a kind word. Kind word turns away wrath. Sometimes you're supposed to counter sue your enemies and drive them all the way to the Supreme Court of the land. That's what Paul does in the book of Acts. He takes on his enemies legally and insists that they give him his freedom legally. That's very different than a kind kind word turns away wrath. Sometimes you're supposed to lower yourself out of a basket, in a basket, out of town, because your enemies want you dead. Okay? Other times you're supposed to ordain your former enemy as your pastor. That's what happened with Paul. Right? So there's just different things we got to do. There's no one size fits all when it comes to treatment of our enemies, except prayer. Except prayer. You can be running out of town so you don't die praying. And you can be eating and giving kind words to your enemies praying. That's the first piece of wisdom I get from this command. The second piece of wisdom I get from this command that I think is just so, so good is that prayer makes sure my heart's in the right place towards my enemies, doesn't it? Prayer makes sure my heart's in the right place towards my enemies. Because let's be honest, when you first get confronted, when you first get faced with, when you first get assaulted by an enemy, verbally, physically, whatever, whatever, 
The knee-jerk reaction of the flesh is bitterness, anger. I think I pointed out a few weeks ago, we all get real eloquent in our minds. When we got nothing will make you eloquent like a good enemy. It's not an accident the best speeches come from war, okay? Not an accident. All these generals, you know. Okay. The flesh's reaction to an enemy is hate, retribution, anger, cold shoulder, revenge. But you just take just a couple of seconds and start saying, our Father who art in heaven. And you start remembering that you were an enemy of God. That you were assaulting him. That you were insulting him. That you were bitter towards him. That he had every right and every desire at one sense to cast you into hell. And you realize that he reached down and made you his reconciled child. And now they're coming after you. You can pray. You can pray. And, and why prayer is so critical is because we're told in 1 Corinthians that if you give your body to be burned, that is, you suffer martyrdom at the hands of your enemies, but you don't have love, it's worthless. You're not going to heaven. That's the, that's the message of 1 Corinthians 13. You can do martyrdom under the, the knives of your enemies, but if there isn't love, it's nothing. It profits you nothing, says Paul. But you can't be praying and not loving, not for long. And I love prayer too because prayer can be, a, prayer can be pursued before the feelings have got the memo, right? You can start praying. You read the Psalms, you read the Psalms. You read the, does that guy always feel like it? Why are you cast down within me, all my soul? You're not feeling like it tons of the time. But he takes his soul in hand, and I think it would be an amazing thing if every single enemy that came into every mind in this room was a prayed-for individual. Just imagine, we might even be pastored by some of the people who are persecuting the church right now. I always, I always play out the Paul relationship, you remember? You know, Paul's doing a hospital visit, loving this person. They're like, hey, Paul, you remember that time you were trying to kill me? <laughs> and now Paul loves them and would die for them. Why? There must have been someone praying for that enemy of the church. Brings me to the third thing I want to mention from this passage. Where are you going to get inspiration to keep loving people? Because someone said Jesus. That's a good one. I have another one from the passage, the text. Where are you going to get inspiration to keep loving your enemies? Because here's the thing. Your enemies keep providing new fuel to the fire to not love them. Right? And it's amazing. Once you get sideways with someone, isn't it amazing how everything they do just stirs up the fires? that can lead to hate and bitterness and resentment. And what Jesus gives us as a constant reminder to help us love our enemies is the weather. It's the weather. You're like, I didn't my, I didn't my devotions this morning. You'll be okay. Just look at the weather. That can teach you a great Deal. Now you should do your devotions too, but look at this. Look at the weather. Verse 44, but I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your Father who's in heaven, for he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and the unjust. Now, pretty much every good thing on the planet comes from the mixture of sun and rain, right? Unless you're wearing a total polyester shirt, hello, 1979. Unless you're uh, wearing a totally polyester shirt, 
your, your, your clothing is the f- product of cotton or whatever, the sun and the rain combo on the soil. All the food you ate this morning for breakfast, all the food you're planning to eat after church, it's all the product of sun and rain. And what's amazing is that the God of this universe with lying corporate lawyers, not that they all are, just some of them, and sex traffickers, with liars and cheaters and thieves, with the people who've hurt you, harmed you, abused you. He just keeps giving them meals every single day. And it would be injustice on his part. It would be aiding and abetting. He would be aiding and abetting criminals if it wasn't for this, that in all of his son and in all of his reign, he has a redemptive purpose. And it's spelled out for us in Romans chapter 2. The kindness of the Lord is meant to lead you to repentance. Just how nice he is to you. You ignore him, show up at church, ignore him, go your own way, ignore him, and you just keep eating. And and it's almost always good. I mean, he just is tantalizing the taste buds of the evil, caring for them. And it, it would be aiding and abetting, except it's got this redemptive purpose. You know, one of the things that I don't like about living in the city is that weather becomes something that's only a matter of personal convenience, right? Sun and rain is just a matter of, am I going to be able to go out today? But if you get out to anyone who's connected to the land at all, in any way, shape, or I just actually was out of town this week, meeting with some pastors from a smaller town, and first question, you getting rain in Louisville? Yeah, we're getting a little rain. I barely knew, because I hadn't been paying attention. Kept being in buildings like this, because I'm one of those city people. He's like, because we're getting some rain, and I love the rain, because it makes the fence posts go down easier. It makes the seeds go in the, the, the ground a little easier. It makes the crops come up. It's a reminder of where all the good comes from. And so maybe... Instead of just looking at the sun and the rain as a matter of is it going to be nice for wearing shorts or do I need a rain jacket, you need to go outside every day or check the weather on your phone every day and you need need to make a mental note. Look at that. He's feeding the evil again. He's caring for his enemies again. He's caring universally for his enemies. He's caring generously for his enemies. And so can I. In fact, the logic here in the verse is, if you do this, you're like sons of your Father who is in heaven, so that you may be sons of your Father who's in heaven. Now, don't miss the logic here. The logic here is not, if you love your enemies, then you get to be a child of God. No, no, it's your Father. He's already your Father. Okay? It's same logic that we have later on in the passage when it's going to say to us, that we must be perfect as our heavenly Father is perfect. So the logic is not, do this and then you'll be a son. The logic is, do this, this is how the sons act. Now I'll tell you one little thing I do for recreation and then I'll be done. Sometimes during the Sunday school hour, I'll go for a walk in the uh, Emmanuel Kids Wing and I'll look in the little rooms and You know, you look in those windows and you go, they're having a bad day in there. (laughs) And then you look in the the next window and you think, oh, it's peace and harmony uh, in that room. It kind of depends week to week. But one of the jobs I like to do, one of the things I love to do is I like to just look at the kids and especially the ones I don't know too well and say, can I figure out who their parents are? Just by looking at them. And uh, I often can. I often can. It's amazing, the set of the eyes, the color of the hair, a hunch of the back, just, just immediately. And, and I'm getting, be, I've pastored long enough now that I'm actually seeing like grandparents in kids in the nursery. 
And the reason for that is, as a general rule, sons and daughters look like fathers and mothers. General rule. Even when you get adoption, you wind up with personality characteristics. And the whole argument of this passage is, if you'll look at the weather that rains and puts sunshine on all God's enemies, and then you'll act like that, even to your enemies, you'll be just like your father which is the highest thing a person can ever be called to. And you don't need a significant platform. You don't need anyone to notice you. He notices you. And he notices when you're acting in accordance with creation, just like his son. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your grace. We thank you so much for your kindness. We thank you that you've given us rain and son, and you've cared for us. Even when we were your enemies, you even saved us when we were your enemies. I pray that you'd take those who are not your people this morning and let them re-look at their meals and re-look at the sunny skies and think, who is this God who loves me even though I hate him? And they would see your son dying on the cross for sinners and they would be saved. Lord, save our enemies. Bless our enemies. Give us wisdom with our enemies, but above all, give us love. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 